Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 4 of The Real Man. Now last time we tackled one of the most successful horror franchises of all time. Or one third of it anyway. Question, which is more frightening? Fact or fiction? Let's find out. Horror films have tremendous power. They can reflect our innermost fears or evoke the underlying issues of society. But at their very core, they are purely entertainment. They can provide temporary escape from the horrors of real life for some people, giving them something else to be afraid of. For an hour or two at least. Prime example being the universal monster movie craze during World War II. People flocked to movie theaters in droves, paying hard-earned money to witness acts of terror perpetrated by unearthly creatures like Count Dracula, the Frankenstein monster, the Wolfman, the Mummy, the creature from the Black Lagoon, and the Invisible Man. Meanwhile in Europe, the heroic allied forces were bravely fighting to eliminate the scourge of Nazi tyranny, forcing themselves to witness firsthand the harrowing results of Hitler's final solution. Sometimes make-believe monsters just can't hold a candle to very real demons. However, sometimes fiction and truth can overlap when you see some horror films marketed with the words based on a true story. Several of these true story horror films exist in the world today, and they're all done with varying degrees of credibility and quality. And some of them are so well done, they blend fiction and reality together so much that you can scarcely tell the difference between the two. And now for the cool show and tell portion of the episode. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Psycho, Silence of the Lambs all have a big time boogeyman to headline them in the forms of Leatherface, Norman Bates, and Buffalo Bill. But what most people don't know is that all three of these bad guys are all incomplete portraits of just one person. Real life Wisconsin murderer, Ed Gein, with all the sick and twisted details of his life and crimes as source material. Virtually everything that those three guys did, Ed Gein did all of it, and then some. William Friedkin's The Exorcist is a horror classic. However, what not many people realize, it's supposedly based on a true story. Now, according to William Peter Blatty, who was the fellow that wrote the screenplay for the movie and the novel that the movie's based on, said that he had heard about an incident when he was in college, about a small boy named Roland from St. Louis who apparently was possessed by some manner of demonic presence that required the services of an actual exorcist in order to resolve it. The controversial classic, Henry Porter of a Serial Killer, was based on the confessions of alleged mass murderer Henry Lee Lucas, who ultimately after his capture would go on to confess to well over 3,000 murders all across the United States. Most of them, however, being bullshit. Then there's the classic haunted house story, The Amityville Horror, which was based on a book of the same title. It was a real life account of George and Kathy Lutz, who detailed the alleged instances of paranormal activity that they and their three small children experienced just after moving into their dream home at 112 Ocean Avenue in the town of Amityville, Long Island. Apparently, these instances were so severe, they were forced to flee their home in the dead of night just 28 days after moving in. Then there's the Chinese horror film Men Behind the Sun by director T.F. Mao. Now, this apparently was a dramatized version of the real crimes committed by the infamous Unit 731 research facility, a biological weapons lab that was located in enemy-occupied Manchuria during World War II. Now, it was controlled by the Japanese Imperial Army, and by all accounts, 400,000 Chinese men, women, and children went into the front doors of this place and never made it out. Reason being, they were used as guinea pigs in actual hellish experiments that defy comprehension. 
Now I could keep going by listening to these movies, but we would be here for quite a while. The film that we are tackling for today's episode is one that not many people have heard of, I reckon. It hails from the 18 year gap between Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho and John Carpenter's Halloween. Now this was a period of time when there were several horror movies that popped up on the radar that could arguably be precursors to the modern slasher film as we know it. You know, films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Black Christmas, or the various works of Mario Bava like Bay of Blood or Twitch of the Death Nerve. Now this film was obscure to say the least. Hell, it never even got an official DVD or Blu-ray release until 2013. But it has survived all this time because of its lasting legacy of drawing attention to a small southern town that was once forced to bear witness to a nightmare that was infinitely more frightening than any horror film. This film was called The Town That Dreaded Sundown. The story is set in Texarkana, a small town on the Texas-Arkansas border. The year is 1946 and Texarkana is enjoying the benefits of a post-war housing boom, prompted by the return of American GIs who are hard at work, starting families, and building a future. The trouble begins in March of that year when a young couple are attacked in their car on a remote lover's lane by a masked perpetrator armed with a gun. The young man and woman are savagely beaten, tortured, and left for dead. This brutal attack is merely the beginning of a four month long crime spree committed by a sadistic murderer known only as the Phantom. The viciousness of the crime sends the citizens of Texarkana into a panic, prompting state and local law enforcement agencies to begin an exhaustive manhunt to apprehend the killer. But despite their best efforts, the Phantom would go on to murder five people before vanishing without a trace. He was never positively identified and could still be walking the streets of Texarkana to this very day. Now the town that dreaded sundown was brought into existence by a man named Charles B. Pierce, director of films like The Legend of Boggy Creek, Winterhawk, and The Evictors. Now Pierce had lived in the Texarkana area at one time or another and was quite familiar with the story of the Phantom and after Boggy Creek came out and was a success, he thought that this could make a potentially good follow up to it. So he used the money that he had earned from the legend of Boggy Creek to finance the picture and then he went to the people of Texarkana and got their cooperation and their blessing to shoot on location. After that was over, he went to a fellow by the name of Jim Roberson to hire him as director of photography. And that was a great choice because Roberson's cinematography makes me think of that dark and gritty style that Sam Peckinpah was expert at in his films in the 70s. Now, throughout the film, there is this voiceover narration track that's performed by actor Vern Steyerman, who had worked with Pierce before on The Legend of Boggy Creek. Now, first time I watched this film, I hated the voiceover narration track. I thought it didn't belong there and it just took me out of the movie. But now that I've rewatched the film several times now, I begin to realize that it's integral to the composition of the piece. It gives, it gives the whole film this pseudo documentary vibe that serves to remind you, the audience, that at least some of what you're watching actually happened. With Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho being the undisputed granddaddy of all slasher films, some have tried to argue that The Town of Dreaded Sundown is the first true modern slasher movie. While yes it's true that it did precede John Carpenter's Halloween by two years, and yes it has many staples of the genre, I find myself hesitating to call it a full on slasher flick. For one thing, the gore level is way too tame. Now, it's true that it achieved some of that minimalist tone that made John Carpenter's Halloween a su success ultimately. However, in Black Christmas in 1974, they were already pushing the envelope in terms of big screen violence. Hell, they even pulled off the holiday themed horror film shtick before Halloween did. But since this movie is indeed based on somewhat of a true story, we have to forgive the director for not going far enough. Then it employs the idea of the masked 
killer I, uh, concept. Now, once again, it was done before in Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 1972. Hell, and it was done even before that in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. But once again, based on a true story. Now let's talk about the acting for a moment. Pierce employed a lot of local acting talent from the Texarkana area, and they're not awful by any means. They do as they're asked, but they're not going to be winning any Academy Awards anytime soon. However, there are five diamonds in the rough that deserve mentioning. First up is the character of Sheriff Deputy Norman Ramsey, played by Andrew Prine. Now, Ramsey's sort of your typical good old boy that doesn't hesitate to help his fellow man when they need it the most. However, when the Phantom's crime spree begins, he shows off another facet to his southern gentleman persona. That he is an extremely gifted and capable cop with these uh, incredible instincts that often serve him right. Now, Prime has this unique quality to his performance that makes the, the character very likable, heroic, and capable, but also very sheltered and naive particularly in the scenes in the aftermath of the Phantom's crimes when he's surrounded by carnage, he just looks completely overwhelmed. Reason being, he has no experience with crimes of such savagery. And I think that just makes Ramsey more of a real character to me. He feels real. Next up is the character of Captain J.D. Lone Wolf Morales, the legendary Texas Ranger sent in to either catch the Phantom or kill him. He is expertly portrayed by veteran cowboy actor Ben Johnson. Now Johnson's in his proper element, but as this no-nonsense cop that's going to get things done his way. And he's so gifted at portraying the iconic image of the Texan, basically with his 10-gallon hat, his cowboy boots, his six-shooter, and a quick-draw holster. He's warm, he's friendly, he's cordial, he's tough, but also fearful. He's genuinely afraid that the Phantom's going to slip through their fingers if they don't catch him quick, which makes him very human. All in all, Johnson and Prine do really well in portraying the image of the manly Southern lawman, and they both play the hell out of that archetype. Next up is the small role of Mrs. Helen Reed, the sole survivor of the Phantom's final attack. She is played by actress Dawn Wells, who most people probably know best as Marianne on the TV show Gilligan's Island. Now, Wells was cast as Mrs. Reed at pretty much the last minute by Pierce himself, who had worked with her previously on the film Winterhawk. Now, according to a 2013 interview with Wells, she said that she was brought onto the film because the actress they had originally, quote, couldn't act and carry groceries at the same time, unquote. Now, all told, Wells worked on the film for maybe a day and a half, had two to three lines of dialogue at the most, and wasn't even brought in until near the very end of the movie. But that doesn't stop her from giving a great performance and making us connect with her character enough to be on the edge of our seats and praying she makes it to safety. And that's the mark of a fine actress. Next up is my favorite character in the whole film. Lovable goofball patrolman A.C. Benson, nicknamed Sparkplug. He has played to absolute perfection by none other than the director himself, Charles B. Pierce. And he is absolutely hilarious to watch. Now, he's not in the film very much, and I ultimately believe that that's a shame, because his knack for comedy is impeccable. Some of his best highlights include bawling out some disrespectful husband on the phone, dressing up like a woman to nab the Phantom in a sting operation, and then driving a squad car into a swamp while complaining about the lack of a sign warning about the road ending. Now, this movie can be filled with tense scenes. Well, Sparkplug's pre presence in the story eases that tension. Like it has been stated in comic book stories countless times over, a hero is only as good as the villain. The same thing goes for horror films, too. So the fifth and final standout is stuntman Bud Davis as the Phantom. Now, like a few of his masked contemporaries, the Phantom doesn't speak. In fact, he barely makes any kind of noise whatsoever other than breathing. Unlike some legendary slasher villains like Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, or Leatherface, we never get a look at the Phantom under the mask. Now, there's a reason for that. Now, like I said, in reality, they never positively identified the Phantom. 
So, Pierce took the idea of protecting the mystery surrounding his identity, which I think makes him even more frightening. Another detail that sets the Phantom apart from some of his other slasher film contemporaries is his body language. See, rather than giving the Phantom sort of a slow, lumbering, robotic walk that would be indicative of the Frankenstein monster, Davis elects to give him the speed and agility of an alley cat that's eager to pounce. I mean, it really is an art form to acting without speaking, which is why my favorite example is the first attack the Phantom perpetrates in the movie. Now, the young couple are in their car, they're cornered by the Phantom, they're desperately trying to start their car so they can get the hell out of there, but to no avail. At which point the Phantom simply holds up the distributor cap that he ripped off their engine, as if to say, You ain't going nowhere! Now, all in all, the Phantom is every bit as formidable as those other slasher villains, but he's a flesh and blood person, not a supernatural monster. Unfortunately, there is one thing that happens that prevents the Phantom from being as frightening as he could have been. Overexposure. They showed way too much of the Phantom. So much that there's barely any suspense when he actually shows up. And then there's the notion of the white hood over his head with the two eye holes cut out so he can see. Now, I'm not knocking that costuming choice. That's an important connection to history, because the two victims that actually survived the Phantom Attacks described him as wearing such a thing. But in the world of horror films, if you're a serial killer who's trying to get the drop on your intended victims in a dark, heavily wooded area, wouldn't a white bag over the top of your head make you stick out like a sore thumb? While it may not be the stealthiest piece of attire, the white hood does a good job of evoking images that conjure horror. I mean, it's not that dissimilar from the white hoods worn by the Ku Klux Klan, or the hood of a medieval executioner, or even the hood of the Grim Reaper himself. Hell, it worked well for Jason Voorhees being his prime method of concealing his identity long before he donned his iconic white hockey mask in Friday the 13th Part 3. Now get your peanuts ready, because it's time to tackle the elephant in the room. Historical accuracy. Now the film opens with the narrator boldly claiming, Only the names have been changed. Well, after conducting some research of my own, I have discovered that there are at least four discrepancies that I will now point out. First is when the sheriff asks the doctor that's tending to the first female survivor from the beginning of the movie whether or not the girl was raped, and the doctor goes out of his way to say that there's no evidence that she was raped. And then later on in the movie, J.D. Morales asks this psychiatrist about whether he thinks there's a sexual motivation to the Phantom's crimes, and the doctor says, no, there isn't. Well, this is contrary to some real evidence from the actual crimes, where at least two of the Phantom, Phantom's female victims were, were sexually assaulted, the survivor being raped with the barrel of a gun. Now, I don't know Charles B. Pierce's reasons for downplaying this, but I theorize that maybe he did it for commercial reasons, thinking that the idea of a girl being raped in such a way was probably too upsetting to an audience, so he downplayed it. Now, next up is the very famous, or rather infamous scene, where the Phantom kidnaps a female member of the school band, ties her to a tree, and then kills her with her own trombone by means of the hunting knife he fastens to the slide and stabs her every time he plays a note with it. Now, a lot of people who come into the movie watching this for the first time think that this actually is fact. However, it is not. Yes, the real victim did indeed play a, a musical instrument in her school band, but it was a saxophone and it played absolutely no role in her death. The real Phantom simply shot her in the face and left her to rot, two miles away from where he took her. Now, her death is brutal enough, but why in the hell did they change the circumstances of it in such a dramatic way to make it worse? Well, once again, I have no proof, but I think it's a shout out to my first example I used, you know, the girl that was raped with a barrel of a gun. See, I think they wanted to not pussyfoot around that. They didn't want to sugarcoat it and do a shout out to it, so they did it in subtext. You know, girl being penetrated with a metal object? Once again, I have no proof, but if that is the case, why the hell did they get the victims mixed up? Why didn't they attribute it to the right person? 
Well, considering Charles B. Pierce is sadly no longer with us, I doubt we'll ever get an answer to that question. Now, next up is the circumstances of the final phantom attack of the film on the Reed family. Now, Mr. Reed is shot in the back of the head through an outside window, and Mrs. Reed catches one bullet in the face and one through her mouth and out the back of her neck. Now, this actually occurred in reality, but with a major difference. See, in reality, Mrs. Reed never said it was the phantom killer because she never saw the killer. She was too busy running for her life. But considering that this took place around the same time as the other killings and that the same caliber of gun was used, the police naturally assumed it was the phantom. However, in a 2014 book that was written on the crimes, it was stated that the police no longer attribute this particular attack to the phantom. But then again, they were only going by the evidence they had at the time, wasn't for, which wasn't very much. Then lastly, there's the climax of the film. Now, Deputy Ramsey and Captain Morales are hot on the phantom's trail. They momentarily lose sight of him when he jumps across a railroad trestle just as a train passes, but not before wounding him in the leg with a shotgun blast. Well, the train passes by, and the phantom's gone, presumably fleeing into the Arkansas swamps, never to be seen again. Now, this event did not actually occur. Like I said, the police were never even able to positively identify the phantom killer. Now, I saw in a 2013 interview with Andrew Prine that he himself had written the final chase sequence. Reason being, the film needed a de definitive ending. Now, this is an instance where truth has to give way for the benefit of a good story. Plus, it's incredibly satisfying to see that evil son of a bitch on the receiving end of some good old-fashioned frontier justice. All in all, the film isn't a 100% accurate interpretation of the true life events, but it stays true to the spirit of what happened. The film actually did very well in drive-in theaters, but Hollywood mostly overlooked it, and it probably would have forever been lost to obscurity if not for the power of the cult following. The fact that it's connected to a real life tragedy is what's kept it alive all this time. And it's what's caused the young people of Texarkana to seek it out because they're curious about a chapter of their local history. And it spawned a new tradition in Texarkana. Apparently every year on Halloween night, the film screens at Spring Lake Park, which is where some of the actual murders occurred in 1946. And apparently it serves as the plot of a pseudo sequel that was released in 2014. And it's strangely similar to the ending of the film. See, in the film, it ends about 20 years later. The young people of Texarkana are lined up outside the local movie theater to go watch The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Way to break the fourth wall, Charles B. Pierce. Well, anyway, as the crowd goes into the theater, we see a close-up of the, of the Phantom's trademark black boots as he hobbles into the theater because of the shotgun blast he received. I don't know why, but I think that deserves to go on the top 10 list of all-time chilling endings to a horror movie. I mean, not only did this guy get away with murder, he's having a big laugh about it, and he's going to go see the movie of what he did. In a nutshell, The Town That Dreaded Sundown is not the film that created nor redefined the slasher subgenre, but it's still significant because it achieved all of the things that would make Halloween a success and kickstart the 1980s slasher film craze two years before. Now, I'm not trying to say it's a better film than Halloween because it came first. I mean, that's like saying the Model T is a better car than a Chevy Cruze because it came first. The film has flaws. The supporting cast is okay, the violence is way too tamed, and the Phantom is not as scary as he could have been due to overexposure. But with all that being said, Charles B. Pierce still created a decent little horror movie that has the added creep factor of real-life inspiration. In conclusion, I previously called Halloween 3 Season of the Witch an unpolished gem, and I stand by that. I call The Town of Dreaded Sundown a lost relic of a time before Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, or Freddy Krueger. Dig it up and give it a look. But, um, be sure to lock your doors and windows before you do it. <laughs>